you very much for coming. Uh, my name's Phil Eisenberg. I'm the uh, baby member of the PPIC Board of Directors. And as that, officially get to uh, uh, kick this thing off. Uh, I would like to say, however, that I have, in an earlier life, worked with many of you, all of us unindicted co-conspirators in the healthcare world. And so it's fascinating to me that PPIC would uh, decide to take another simple, non-controversial issue <laughs> with no tradition of dispute or animosity anywhere and make sense out of it. But indeed, indeed uh, this is part of the speaker's series and it's what, uh, it's what PPIC does. So I'd, say, I'd particularly like to thank our guests here today. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Secretary Dooley, long-suffering uh, uh, Jerry Brown administrative type who receives telephone calls at baseball games at her home in the evening and she has to struggle to answer all the questions of a really smart governor who delights in asking unexpected questions. Uh, we're uh, very happy today that uh, Dr. Michael Katz from the, uh, uh, the, LA, uh, the LA Health uh, uh, Department was able to be with us and provide uh, guidance on what's going on down there. And uh, my previous running buddy, Sandra Hernandez, runs the, uh, the uh, California Healthcare Foundation, but she used to run the San Francisco Foundation, and we did a task force many years ago uh, recommending uh, what Kaiser Permanente ought to do about its uh, dispute resolution system, which was highly interesting, also controversial, and very engaging. Now, this is part of a speaker series for PPIC, and uh, we've got to thank our sponsors. Uh, you'll find their names in the program material, but uh, kind of in alphabetical order, the Applied Materials Foundation, the Bank of America, the Bergruen Institute on Governance, California Endowment, uh, a mom and pop uh, health care plan uh, in California, the David and Lucy Packer Foundation, the David and Susan Coulter Family Foundation, the James Irvine Foundation, Pacific Life Foundation, the Bechtel Foundation, Sierra Health Foundation. You would think that this is about health from the, uh, but there is Southern California Edison, the Stewart Foundation, Union Bank, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and, and Knowledge Partner, McKinsey and Company. I noticed that the last panel, I think that they're called a Knowledge Partner, uh, an acronym, a, a, a language of, uh, of public meetings these days. But more importantly, this, this series where we try to bring smart people to tell us answers to every question, as this group has promised to do, uh, is, is only possible because the donors have uh, allowed us to uh, do this. Two housekeeping issues. Before you leave today, you will find in your program material an oddly colored slip of paper. Uh, if you will fill it out, please, and give us your reaction to uh, today's panel, we would appreciate it very much. We're always trying to update, revise, modify, and adjust these things, and we do need your reaction. Uh, staff will be at the door patting you down for proof that you have submitted these uh, documentations. And number two, which I will do as soon as I go back to the table, uh, turn off your cell phones. Uh, the staff and I will shoot any cell phone that rings during this meeting, except, of course, that the governor calls Secretary Dooley, in which case we'd expect her to take the message on the microphone and deal with it, which we'd be interested in hearing. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, uh, for doing this, for joining us here. I'd like to uh, introduce our president and CEO, Mark Baldessari, who will take it from here. Mr. Baldessari. Phil, thanks very much for that introduction and for, for providing some humor for us uh, at lunchtime. I, I also uh, want to acknowledge that our, our, the chair of our board of directors, Donna Lucas, is here today. So, um, and there are many people from our staff who are, um, who are in attendance here today, and I just want to thank uh, especially the members of our staff who put together the fact sheet today on uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, and hopefully you'll have a chance to meet with them later on. We have a terrific panel, and I want to get right to it today with the panel. Um, Phil, uh, I think, provided a very nice introduction. I just want to say by way of introduction that um, um, 
This for me is the dream panel on this topic of, affordable, of the Affordable Care Act um, and the implementation in California today. Um, and I'm really so grateful that, uh, that each of you has taken the time to, uh, to join us here today. Um, I don't think they need any uh, further introduction, but I just you know, want to again um, state uh, partly the obvious. Diana Dooley is, is the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services in California and the chair of, of Covered California, so she's really in, been in a, in a very critical role. And um, in December, I went to visit uh, Diana in, in her office and actually asked her if she would participate in this event. We didn't know exactly when it would be. Um, Mitch Katz in a very important uh, position in Los Angeles as a director of uh, Health and Human Services, I'm sorry, director of Health Services for the County of Los Angeles, the second largest um, county health services in the country and very critical uh, to uh, implementation of, of many aspects of the Affordable Care Act and, and, and Mitch, we met um, at PPIC a few months ago and thanks for coming uh, Thank you. from Los Angeles today. Uh, Sandra Hernandez, uh, who is the president of and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation and um, has been active and in the, the world of, of healthcare for many, many years, um, and recently has taken this position. Um, and I think indicative of just what are the, what, what are the, the important factors in, that have gotten us here in implementation is that we have somebody from state government, we have somebody from local government, we have somebody from the nonprofit sector to, uh, to, to really help us, help inform us about where we are. Let me just briefly paint uh, the picture of where we are today. Um, for many months, uh, there were questions about what uh, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, would look like. What would the first uh, period of enrollment look like? And we now know that um, there were um, about 8 million um, uh, people in the U.S that in, enrolled in um, insurance during this first um, period. And it exceeded expectations, and there was a, a big surge at the end, uh, leading to that 8 million. In California, about 1.4 million newly insured through um, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, beyond those numbers are even larger numbers when we talk about the numbers of people who have now become eligible and enrolled uh, for, for, for Medi-Cal under the new um, requirements, um, which have created more uh, uh, enrollment in Medi-Cal today. And in California altogether, um, there's over three million newly enrolled combined in, in Medi-Cal. And um, it, with the new, new, new requirements in Medi-Cal plus the, uh, the insured, uh, newly insured. So let's uh, begin the conversation and I'll throw this out uh, to the three of you. Um, okay, so we've gone through the first enrollment period. Um, what can we say about um, how the Affordable Care Act will change health care in California? Diana, maybe we should start with you. Well, I think it, there are. I think it's very difficult to know at this point how it will, but that it will is without question. Uh, everything, I'm reminded uh, of a phrase that was attributed to Albert Einstein that was used in the 80s in the Beyond War movement that said, everything has changed, save our way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel about the healthcare system, uh, that we have the opportunity to um, uh, redesign in ways that couldn't have happened without the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I think that we focused a lot on the coverage expansion uh, and people tend to think that that is the Affordable Care Act is the coverage expansion, but it really is just one leg of a three-legged stool. Um, the other two legs are very important and we have also embraced them in California. One is payment and delivery reform and one is health and wellness. Uh, and those three together, universal coverage, redesigning the system of payment with correct incentives that uh, really emphasize wellness and the wellness programs um, 
both public and private, uh, will uh, significantly change the opportunities, uh, not only uh, for health, but the triple aim of better health, better care, uh, and lower cost. Mm. Uh, and it's going to take us a long time to get there. Uh, and with any change, but certainly with change on the magnitude of this, uh, there are going to be bumps. So while we I uh, have had some success in California, uh, and I'm very proud of that, uh, and it is to the credit of the people of California. We have a lot of people, as I look across this room, uh, many, many partners uh, in this effort, and I think it's reflected in your uh, bringing together the uh, private philanthropy com uh, community, the local government, and the state government uh, to take advantage uh, to the maximum uh, that we are able to. So. Um, it is going to change, uh, it's going to change not just the system, uh, but people's expectations of how they use care, what they expect from <coughs> care, the difference between getting care and being healthy. All of that conversation is happening because of the Affordable Care Act. Mm. Thank you. Well, I would say on the ground, all of the work that Secretary Dooley and our staff have done has really worked because we're seeing much, much higher a percentage of people being covered, uh, in our case, almost all through Medicaid, a little bit uh, through the exchange. And, and in, the, in the patients that we see, there is, in fact, real gratitude. There is a sense that they have a payer. There is a sense that they have easier access to care. Uh, as the Secretary was saying, I think going forward, the real challenge is the delivery system, because insurance is not actually care. Insurance is a vehicle for paying for the care that you need, but it is not the care itself. Uh, having an a insurance card is neither you know, proof that you have access, nor is it proof that when you have access, the person speaks your language or understands you or is able to, in fact, relieve your suffering. And so the, what the Affordable Care Act does on the ground in a place like Los Angeles is it particularly intensifies the need for the system to improve, for markedly more access, because with having insurance, a large number of people now uh, can point to, well, I have a right to a primary care doctor or nurse practitioner in their panel. I have a right to uh, being able to see a specialist in a reasonable period of time. And those are things that should have always happened, that people always should have had a human right to, but hasn't always been true. And so this influx of people uh, who feel more empowered, which I think is a very positive thing, um, will drive the delivery system. Uh, certainly, it can't talk about LA without saying there are a million people in Los Angeles who, this is such a large county, who remain uninsured, uh, the vast majority of whom are undocumented and will not qualify for any federal benefit at the current time. And part of the challenge for us and how it fits with the other half is uh, we are determined to provide a single standard of care. Uh, we, don't, we don't ask immigration status and we don't determine our care based on people's immigration status. And, and I would say, you know, d while immigration is an incredibly polarizing issue in this country, I have never met a healthcare provider, a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, who asked anyone who was interested in their immigration status when delivering care. So in, in delivery systems, you know, people are not, whatever their political stripe is, they're not, and they may have a particular opinion, as outside the office, but in the office, people want to provide care to people who are sick and need that care. Um, and our delivery system challenge uh, is intensified because we are determined that all of the access improvements that we make in terms of timeliness, in terms of impanelment, apply to both the people who are insured and those who are uninsured. And that's both because of the ethical reasons for doing it and also just, again, the practical reasons that you cannot run a delivery system where you tell doctors and nurses and pharmacists to treat their patients differently. It just doesn't work that way. Mm. I was at a meeting the other day uh, sort of looking at sort of the overall health economics of the ACA and uh, there was a very interesting analogy in, in this conversation about the opportunities for payment reform to help the delivery system do the right thing. 
uh, by patients, by outcomes, and by cost. And the analogy was we're, we're still riding two horses. We're riding a fee-for-service horse, and we're riding a uh, managed care horse. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fee-for-service horse is going to be ridden until it drops. <laughs> uh, and I, I thought that, uh, that summarized, uh, in some ways, uh, how schizophrenic we are right now in our uh, payment systems. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, uh, under the Secretary's leadership, a lot of work really thinking about how to uh, change payments in order to get uh, to the quality and cost uh, paradigm. Um, I think the other thing that's just really worth notable, and that is that Medi-Cal uh, is really a mainstream program mm -hmm. and is increasingly a mainstream program in California. What do you mean um, by mainstream? Well, if, you know, estimates are that up to one in three Californians will be at some point, if not on an ongoing basis, on Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that has a lot of implications uh, for the program, for its image, for providers, uh, both traditional and, and new providers uh, trying to serve uh, the Medicaid population, Medi-Cal population in California. Um, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity, really building off what Mitch said, just that these folks have interfaced with our safety net system at a lot of different points of access over the years. Most of it not where you'd want them to. A lot of that in uh, emergency rooms and places where you go when you really don't have a lot of other uh, access points. And so I think we have a huge opportunity uh, in front of us to really uh, think about how we design that program, what access looks like at that program, and most importantly of all, for beneficiaries to learn to use the delivery system at the most effective place, at the most effective time to get the right care. Uh, that's an extraordinary undertaking, I think. Uh, and we'll take uh, all the muster that we took to try to get enrollment up uh, on the deadlines that we had and then some. Uh, and so really thinking about that program and how uh, we measure access behind it, as Mitch was referencing, uh, how we get constituents and consumers to think about using those cards and using their points of access as wisely as possible, I think really is version two of, of healthcare reform in California. What surprised you about ACA implementation so far? <laughs> Where do I start? At the first exchange meeting, um, got covered California in um, uh, October when we launched mm -hmm. and it worked. I said then that I was reminded of the titles of, of two songs. The first was from one of my favorite musicals, Fiddler on the Roof, when the little tailor comes in and says, Miracle of Miracles. Um, and the second was the Rolling Stones. You know, you can't always get what you want, but if you try real hard, you just might find sometimes you get what you need. And I think that that's what surprised me, that it, it was so enormous, and in some ways, um, if we really thought about the enorm if we could really see how big it was and how hard it would be, uh, we might not have tried. Mm -hmm. But um, in California, we had a long history of people knowing that the system as it worked wasn't working, and it really isn't a system. I often say Rube Goldberg himself wouldn't build something that looked like healthcare uh, in, this, in this country. Um, but we tried in a variety of ways, and in 07, under a Republican leader in California, we came very close to getting what was in Massachusetts, uh, a market-based program that was an alternative to single payer. We built this system that we have now on a market-based approach. It wasn't what people on the left wanted, it wasn't what people on the right wanted, but it took us down a path. So California had some experience with that. Um, the governor, uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, embraced it, uh, established the exchange, established the low-income health program that allowed Mitch and his colleagues in the counties to begin redesigning their system to be ready for the kind of care that we need to provide uh, in the future. Um, and so we inherited that and took that baton in January 
January of 2011. Regrettably, we had another baton, which was a chronic deficit. Mm -hmm. So the first couple of years focused on the deficit. We were implementing this on a conditional basis. We had to solve the debt. The governor made that very clear, uh, or we wouldn't go forward and embrace all that we had the potential to. So in some ways, I think um, the humility that was required to do what we did in the first year made us always um, a little cautious. And we did that that we had to do when we had to do it. And we found that we had done just enough to get us started. But there is huge unmet need. We have a treasure trove of data now. We have some evidence. Everything we've done to this point has been on the basis of modeling and speculation and theories about how it might work. Um, now we have some evidence. We've got a lot of uh, people enrolled. We're in the process of understanding who they are. Uh, we'll go through a process of determining how they're going to get care and where they're going to get care. Um, and it's a very organic, bottom-up approach um, that started in the counties uh, and has built. And I think that will continue to do it. I think that we won't reform the system from a top-down way. We, uh, the, the system, this pressure on the system, they often say, it's like a pig and a python. I think it's an elephant. Or what's a bigger, the biggest whale uh, that is moving through the system. And that is going to create some um, innovative chaos, some disruptive tension. I don't know what the word in Silicon Valley, disruptive innovation. Um, it, it, the system is, it won't be able to function in the way it has in the past, mm -hmm. which is going to create some uh, dislocation and some pain, but we're going to move to something different. And I think we have a roadmap and a design. So um, I guess my biggest surprise is that we pulled it off uh, hmm. to the extent that we have, but uh, there is no mission accomplished sign uh, up yet. Uh, no, we the don't jury, see any here today. The jury is right. still out. We've got a lot of hard okay. work still to do. Mitch, anything, any surprise for you? Well, uh, to, to follow up on, on what the Secretary said, certainly the, the ease with which the low income health program transitioned to Medicaid was a, a huge success. And uh, in very real numbers for us, we had enrolled in the low income health program, 320,000 people over a period of uh, two and a half years. And you can appreciate that without that early enrollment under the low income health program, if you had just turned on Medicaid in January 2nd, mm -hmm. right, you would have had 300,000 people and more, you know, saying, okay, you know, I want my Medicaid now. It was 650,000 right. statewide. Right. Yeah. So it's a huge, huge number of people. And because we had enrolled them early on and we, we as Los Angeles impaneled them and then produced the data files and the state successfully converted our data to almost everybody moving on to Medicaid, Not wasn't perfect, but no computer matching system ever is perfect. Now all of these people instantly uh, got got Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to offer one example from uh, what the Secretary says about you know, the, the success you can have under the ACA in terms of innovation. Uh, one of my major concerns in preparing for the health reform was how I would ever deal with specialty demand, which is a huge issue everywhere in safety net systems. When I got to Los Angeles, there were many clinics where they were actually giving people cardiology appointments in nine months which is a you know, completely absurd notion. If you can't provide it sooner than that, you shouldn't even give the appointment. Um, and we uh, used a platform called Electronic Consultation, which had worked in San Francisco. But San Francisco, it had worked in one public hospital connected to 11 uh, clinics, all of which were run by the public health system. And it was very successful, but could, it, could you take it you know, to Los Angeles? And would it actually run? Uh, and so we are now doing approximately 25,000 consults a month. It's just like mind-boggling numbers of primary care doctors consulting with specialists who are at four different hospitals, different af academic affiliations, different employment, and it's all working. And so it enables us to provide the kind of access that health reform demands. So the, I mean, not every innovation will be successful, but it is possible to use the ACA and the access demands to try to do things in a different way. Hmm. 
Sandra, anything surprise you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, it was really wonderful, a wonderful surprise mm. uh, that uh, we got so many people who had been outside of the system to try to knock on the door and get through the door. Mm. Uh, now, not everybody did, um, and there's still certainly work to do, and a lot of information is now coming out of the philanthropic sector trying to give benefits to, uh, to the next open enrollment process. Mm. Um, but I thought uh, both the notion that we ought to build this thing so everybody's in uh, really got through across the state, even while we were very targeted trying to get people, as Mitch said, enrolled through the low-income health programs into Medicaid, Medi-Cal, but also through Covered California. And so I think in many ways, and particularly if you look across the country, um, that it went as well as it did, notwithstanding a bunch of challenges that, that Covered California and others worked through, that we got as many people through the system as we did was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot, of, a lot of upside surprise for everyone in a sense that um, maybe California was better prepared in terms of the work that, um, that, that preceded this and, and expectations about how, what, what the work was that was needed. Um, so now we're at this stage. We could talk a lot about the specifics, but give us a sense of uh, what keeps you up at night in terms of <laughs> what, uh, what implementation is uh, now. You know? And if you don't like that question, yeah. what's on top of your to-do list? <laughs> well, we've kind of fallen into a pattern here. I'm trying not to just jump into the space. Well, you want to give it to somebody another, else first? That's another okay, place, too. but... Um, there are, as I said at the outset, there are so many changes. Uh, one change we haven't talked about that um, I think is um, uh, going to be a, a big challenge, and that is the integration of mental health and substance use disorder now let's talk services. About that. Uh, it's very, very, um, it's, it, it's revolutionary. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had mental health parity of the law in mm -hmm. California for many years, but it hasn't de facto happened. Mm -hmm. um, and it is now embedded in the plans uh, that uh, it will be required. Um, but even as Mitch said, uh, requiring it and getting a card doesn't mean you're going to get access. Mm -hmm. So as much pressure as there is on the primary care system and the e-consults and the, uh, there are so many ways that uh, uh, physicians are finding ways to extend their ability to meet the needs. Um, the integration of um, behavioral health uh, in physical health um, is, is going to be, I fear, slow um, and very difficult um, to, uh, to and accomplish. And what's the reason for that difficulty? I, I think um, the, there are still biases uh, about the recognition of the conditions and the causes and the treatment. I think there on are the limitations. On the part of physicians? Or, I think or on the part of society broadly, okay. and even in the part of the people who need the services. Uh -huh. um, and we have two physicians here. I'll yes. be interested in yeah. their uh, reactions, I think. We've got limitations on the number of providers. We've got limitations on the relationship between the physical health providers and the social service, mm. uh, the um, behavioral health mm -hmm. providers. Uh, we've got most of our mental health that has been provided by county programs, and we've got uh, uh, private plans now having to work out contract relationships with government providers that haven't existed before. I mean, I think there are, are a long list of structural impediments um, that... And can I just ask, sure. is this more of an... And anybody jump in on this? I know, Sandra, you, this is a big topic for you, and Mitch, I know in Los Angeles it's, it's a big issue too. Um, are we talking more about the, uh, this from the standpoint of uh, the medical uh, side or from the standpoint of the insurance coverage side or both? Well, I actually think it, if I could just pop in yeah. there, I, mean, I think it has a lot more to do with overall cost in the system. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, it, you can look at it from the perspective of comorbidities and see that you have patients with a lot of chronic diseases and your ability to manage those chronic diseases where you want to manage them, mm. which is outside of hospitals and in clinics and in community, um, uh, you know, really does uh, sort of require a, um, a very different uh, uh, focus on behavioral health. I mean, Mitch and I are both internists, and if you go to a CME course for primary care internal medicine, 
maybe on the fifth day of a week course, you would get an hour on how to manage a patient with depression in terms of antidepressants. Mm. So uh, we have uh, a lot of work to do. Yeah. We also, you know, we have uh, very few evidence-based protocols for treatment of comorbidities of patients with chronic diseases and with behavioral health issues or substance use issues. Yeah. We have a lot of research work to do in that space to try to develop those and, and uh, um, uh, and help people to do them. Mm. And then I think we also, uh, we have very different cultures into which we provide this care. Uh, substance abuse treatment, uh, substance use treatment has all different sorts of models, social yeah. models, medical models, in spite of the fact that we have better medical modalities now than we did before. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of work to do in this space, and I, I think it has to do with outcomes, but it also has to do with cost, which fundamentally has to do with the sustainability mm -hmm. of these rates in any of the payer sources that we're talking about. Mitch, what about I, I, I would agree when uh, I think part of the challenge of integrating uh, behavioral health with physical health is that we even talk about integrating them, mm -hmm. right? The, when I, I, I see... Uh, people through an urgent care clinic, monolingual, very low income people, monolingual Spanish speaking, very low income in East LA. And really, the, they come with some set of health issues um, that are a combination of physical symptoms, emotional and psychological symptoms, substance use issues, um, difficult family situations, violence, traumatic events. Um, often for what Sandra was talking about, the right place to deliver the care in some cases would be a supportive housing apartment, would be the single most cost-effective intervention that you could do to keep them out of the hospital, out of an institution. Uh, and so I've increasingly thinking for our, the people that we take care of, that there's been this duality set up of the healthcare system. People talk about a prevention system, right? Prevention is, you know, all of us need to exercise more, we need to eat better, um, we need uh, planning that makes it, our cities more livable and their whole set of things. What I've begun to think about is maybe there's something in the middle which is care that brings health. And probably part of the problem with health care as it's currently defined is it doesn't generally make people feel healthier. It subjects them to many tests. It provides often many pharmaceuticals, but often without the result that people are actually feeling better at the end of the encounter. And that how we change that to be more relevant um, is really the major challenge. Mm -hmm. Anything else besides uh, the, the behavioral health, mental health piece that keeps you up at night in terms of how, how um, where we go from here with implementation? Well, I think you know, Sandra talked about cost. Co cost is uh, the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, we are what are we doing about the, cost at this point? Anything? Well, it, 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 it's very difficult. I mean, it, it, it feels to me like it's the cost in healthcare is sort of like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody can find a and, handle on And if I can just it. interject, if, all the public opinion polls that I've ever done on health right. care, it's not about access as much as it's about cost, right? Right. And, and, and this is what the public says they're worried about. They so are what are we going to do about, about it. it? And uh, they're worried about it. And it, it depends on uh, who is talking to you, what they mean by cost. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who answer your polls are the people who have co-pays and co-insurance and deductibles. Yeah. And we have a whole another issue of health literacy, which is, yes. uh, you know, aggravated by the fact that most people even who have uh, health insurance that's employer sponsored don't understand it any more than the people who are now buying it for themselves. But I'll uh, set health literacy aside. The, the cost depends a lot on whose cost you're, I, as you might expect, everybody comes in and wants to sit down at my table and talk about it. And everybody tells me how we can solve the cost problem by changing someone else's behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nobody comes in and reaches into their own pocket and takes out their own dime and says, okay, I can spend less. Yeah. And there are so many perverse incentives mm -hmm. in the system about from hospital care to pharmacy care to physician payments. Mm -hmm. uh, as Mitch said, we're paid for treating illness. We're not paid for keeping people healthy. And while we have uh, talked about coordinated care, one of the biggest challenges to the ACA being successful, I believe, is changing how we think about managed care. 
We have to learn from our 1990s experience where managed care was just the purview of the plans uh, and really look at systems of care that include all the treaters. Uh, and they don't ex that those systems don't really exist in this private market construct uh, that we're um, that we're working in. And so one of the um, challenges, one of the first steps that I'm working on, and that I believe very uh, completely, and is at the first is transparency. Mm -hmm. First, we have to know what the costs are and where they're coming from, um, and that's very difficult to do. It sounds easier than it is. Are we making um, progress on that? Uh, I, I think we are. Um, Sandra's uh, foundation uh, and others are, are very interested uh, in, in this work. Sandra, what do you um, think we can do to make costs more transparent? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think, you know, it, it is the horizon, it is the North Star that we really ought to be pointing at. Hmm. I think until we really can follow all of the dollars through all of the system mm -hmm. and ask ourselves, uh, really, are we getting value out of all of these places? Uh, uh, the affordability issue, which is very real. I mean, there are, there are folks in San Francisco who went to enroll mm -hmm. with subsidies and still found insurance very unaffordable. Yeah. And so that affordability piece is really the end of the road uh, with a lot of costs embedded in the system that consumers don't see, other sectors aren't often able to see. Uh, and so I think it's an area where we uh, kind of continue to hack at a path uh, to get as much transparency as we possibly can on costs. And we're committed to, you know, working, continuing to work in that space uh, because we think at the end of the road is affordability. And if you don't have affordability, people fall out of the system, don't re-enroll. Really, you don't have uh, the opportunity to do everything that getting people an insurance card was designed to do. Mm -hmm. and, and Mitch, how do you see costs from, um, sure. you know, from the world you work in? Well, uh, the, the question I was thinking of was, as uh, Sandra and Dan were talking, is, is it possible in California we could have a sensible conversation about this, which the U.S. as a whole is not capable of having? And mm -hmm. the, 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 the sensible conversation is every day Medicaid, private insurance, Medicare, pays for care that large, unbiased panels have said has no value. Hmm. We just accept that. This, this is true every single day. Such Medicaid is paying which would be for, an example. Uh, PSAs would be a good. Okay. U.S. Pre uh, Preventive Services has reviewed the evidence on PSAs and said that, there is, that they do not recommend that any men get them. Um, and it's not just, you, you might say, you know, obviously it's just one example, you might say, well, but that's just a lab test. But the lab test results in biopsies when people's levels are high, and then the biopsies result in a certain number of surgeries and a certain yeah. number of people having rather devastating side effects because once they've learned their cancer, the equation changes. Well, but do, would you pay, do you pay for PSA, then? But why do you pay for it? <laughs> I, I, I yeah. do too. Yeah, I do we too. Do. And, I, for, and not, right. just, not just Medi-Cal, Medicare, and, and it, it, the private insurance pays yeah. for it as well. Right. Everybody's and, paying and for it. Right. Right. Mammography is another example, right. exactly the same. You know, they came out, all the studies said with certain conditions you shouldn't have to have a breast exam every year. I mean, all the conditions, no breast cancer anywhere. I waited two years and I was like, is it almost time? I was so nervous because all of the, you know, everybody says right. you have to have an annual mammogram. I don't need an annual mammogram. But the reality is that I might have breast cancer. And if I do, I'll kick myself for not having that annual mammogram. Even though, so you have population indicators that the evidence tells us, and then you have individual behavior that says, I want it all. I want everything you can possibly do, medicine, uh, writ large. That's the conversation, mm. Mitch, that I think we have to have. I'm sorry, I didn't feel like we have a lot of work to do. We do have a lot of work <laughs> yeah. to do. And um, are there other, other issues besides cost you want to surface right now? Well, cost is, a, especially in my system, I mean, in some ways I feel like I have the easiest job in terms of dealing with cost because uh -huh. we, in our, the, the, the concern always is when you try to have this conversation that you're trying to save money on my back, yeah. right, for some insurance right. company. Uh -huh. One advantage that the public sector has is to the extent that we lower the cost for any single thing, we can provide more care. 
right? And since we're, we're in a market with a finite budget, but an unlimited demand, mm -hmm. right, we have a, a more mission-driven reason to try to reduce costs, but it is very difficult and it will, I mean, I, it, to me, the one thing that most has to deal with is that our current definition of care that should be paid for is that a doctor says so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that is the current working definition. And, and to use Diana's, when we, we were very happy with the guidelines for mammograms every two years because our system wasn't able to give mammograms every year. So it wasn't an issue. We didn't have enough capacity. So for us, wasn't it better to give every woman a mammogram every two years than to give half the women a mammogram every year, right? So it fit the guidelines and it fit our need. We had a major consensus group. We all came to the agreement that we would follow the guidelines. And then I get a report in my own clinic for a woman I sent for mammogram, and the radiologist has written in, at the bottom, normal mammogram, recommend a mammogram in one year. <laughs> I took it, and I said, why are you writing to the primary care doctors? We all agreed, and the, all, the US Preventive Services has said every two years. I said, well, my society recommends every year. Mm -hmm. hmm. Her society of mammographers <laughs> who get paid, for reading mammography recommends every year. Mm -hmm. So she recommends every year, mm -hmm. there it is. So I mean there are some, some, some wind at our back on this. I mean there's the Choosing Wisely campaign right. where a lot of the medical societies have said really we ought to stop doing things that are, that are actually not called for, not beneficial, cost mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. um, potentially create great harms both to patients to populations. I mean, if you look at antibiotic abuse mm -hmm. in this country, we should all be wildly alarmed uh, that we are still doing things that are not medically indicated yeah. and paying for them. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so I think there is some wind at our back. I think the other thing that is important that we haven't talked about yet this morning and that is also uh, uh, new is that there is a whole conversation now about population health and wellness. Let's talk about that. Um, because that, uh, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about here today is how do we take a delivery system that has many still very mm -hmm. perverse incentives in it, it's very hard to change these systems on a dime, even with extraordinary leadership. Uh, and so I think this, you know, what how do we begin to think about population wellness in a much more broad spectrum conversation with a variety of different, uh, very ground up uh, uh, organizations helping us to do that? And, and is this? Uh, it's the third. This a, it's the third. Yeah. Uh, the third leg of the stool. Leg of okay. the stool that I so let, let's talk about how that works and uh, where we are with that now and where we need to go because um, whether we're talking about. Um, um, you know, expanding insurance coverage or um, the, the growth of the, of the Medi-Cal uh, population in California, um, it seems like the broader question is about overall wellness. And what, 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 what programs do we have in place? What can we do? That's just, gonna, just take um, a historic look okay. at that for one second. You know, Diana talked about the last time we did managed care. Uh -huh. And that was the last time we had, I thought, a very robust conversation about population health and wellness. Uh -huh. But there really wasn't any financial dollars in the system to... Are there dollars now? I think there are more dollars now. And certainly the state's uh, you know, innovation plan really does begin to identify areas where we should be working. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think health plans are starting to take incredible leadership in this as well. And I think, frankly, that the fact that the private plans have to sit with the counties and try to figure out what we deal with this population we talked about before who have a lot of chronic diseases and a lot of mental health and other issues gives us an incredible opportunity to better align those forces uh, in uh, a much more downstream, keep people out of hospitals. and. Uh, it really is embedded in ACA. We've got some dollars in it. The state's done a lot of work in this space. I think palliative care is another example of places where it's quite clear what patients want um, and that we have great opportunities to, to really hit the triple aim there. And that is, I think, a very ripe ground for us to help with costs, get better outcomes, better satisfaction, uh, and have people uh, be able to have a voice about where they want to have end-of-life care. Um, let me ask you um, all a question. Um, 
given the expansion in the numbers of uh, uh, in Medi-Cal in California um, and the newly insured that we have, do we have um, is access going to be a problem? And do do we have the physicians? Um, do we have the caregivers for in the Medi-Cal population? Do we have the provider networks? Do, are we going, do we have the capacity to handle what we've, we've now taken in uh, through, through the new enrollment? I think there's um, uncertainty about how much elasticity there is in the mm -hmm. system. Uh, there is Because some. when I hear Mitch talk about um, the fact that people now have to wait um, a long time for a cardiologist or, you know, where, where is this gonna, where is this gonna leave us now? When we have well, more people. there is no magic wand to create more cardiologists or specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the e-consults and a variety of other ways that people are going to use some of these um, uh, uh, relationships between specialists and mm -hmm. primary care uh, are uh, very exciting and, and mention, mention some of them. Um, but I think also the um, relationship of the physicians to the other caregivers within the unit, not just specialists outside, but the um, uh, promotoras and health workers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. We're looking at pharmacists and the expanded uh, services that they can provide in their uh, own offices. A lot of that is going, going to filter out, and we don't know where it's going to land. Hmm. Um, but there is also, I think, um, uh, the recognition that the care is going to be delivered differently and people's expectations are going to change. We, we can't meet the old style of delivering care with the new populations are coming in. It's, it's just not possible. We're talking about more physician assistants, more well, we're nurse I, practitioners? I think we're talking about a, a lot of services. Uh -huh. And I think that to get to a payment system that is more uh, capitated, where you have a whole population and not just the plan receives yeah. a patient, you know, for their enrollees, but their relationships with systems of care, with doctors and hospitals, where they are incentivized uh, to not just do treatment units that George Halverson says all the time, we can't do healthcare like widgets, where you have just a, a, a piecemeal mm -hmm. approach to it. Uh, you've got to have incentives in the system for not only uh, uh, encouraging wellness and helping wellness, but actually, as Mitch says, to make them feel healthy, to make them feel cared for. And, and that is a big challenge in the system uh, that we have. People who have a lot of access and have a lot of doctor's appointments uh, don't feel healthy and they don't feel cared mm -hmm. for. Which is so, what Mitch was right. uh, saying earlier. It's, that's the outcome doesn't really provide that uh, outcome. But some of the plans are doing things, you were talking about uh, uh, housing, but we've got people going in and putting air conditioners in for asthmatics, for example. Mm. And that's a part of the plan when you can really yeah. coordinate the care and determine what does that patient need or that enrollee need, and they're yours and you're gonna have them. Uh, it it changes, and there's a lot of talk. I'll just say, you know, about narrow networks, and mm -hmm. we see a lot and hear about that. Um, but private insurers, uh, the the uh, employer-sponsored care has been narrowing networks for many years. Many of the problems that people are identifying with the Affordable Care Act are actually the problems the Affordable Care Act was designed to solve. Mm -hmm. To begin to look at needing to. Um, you can't have affordability and choice. We can't have all the choice that we've had before and have affordability. And it's, it's going to be a painful transition, as mm -hmm. I said at the outset. Sandra or Mitch? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, we don't yet have really good empiric data uh, geographically about where access is really going to be a problem and where, conversely, there are places with. But we've, we've, we've but, uh, known for years that there are disparities, absolutely. right? Income absolutely. And, and, and race and ethnic. And, in and I think, though, that well, we're going to need to do all the things Diana said and then some. I mean, I think um, people don't like to talk about it, but I think we ought to really be looking at scope of practice. Hmm. Uh, there's a pilot that CHF What's that scope of practice mean 
Well, you know, you have paramedics, for example, that do very, very intensive mm -hmm. uh, 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 care with patients in very acute settings and emergency mm -hmm. settings that they're able to do as long as they're driving from an accident to a hospital emergency room. Right. Um, highly skilled uh, individuals, Definitely. and right now, really, that's all they can do. That, that service or set of services or set of skills that they have that they're highly trained to do uh, could not today be delivered at an urgent care center. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not allowed to mm -hmm. be done. And there is a pilot, we're studying it. Uh, these are all very controversial, but I think we are gonna have to look at extending the capabilities of all of our very trained workforce uh, to get that to be able to reach into places that historically, for whatever reasons, we've walled those off. Is there anything in the current legislative session um, that you're looking at as being very important to moving forward with um, uh, both ACA implementation and improving health care in California? Anything that's any anything? This is not a well, trick question. I mean, I yeah, just no, really, I, is there I'm, anything I, at all? I'm not looking at anything right now. Or are right these now, more long-term issues? Well, I, I, we have a lot of data that we have uh -huh. collected um, that I, I don't know what it's going to show us. Yeah. And so my sense of this moment in time is let's figure out where we are. Okay. I know we can't hit the pause button as, as has been widely yeah. uh, publicized. We still have a backlog of Medi-Cal applications. And as we're, as we're working through those, and I just wanna give a shout out to our partners in the counties, the uh, eligibility workers have been extraordinary. We've had a yeah. lot of a lot of partners on the ground to make this work, but uh, the people in the counties uh, have been particularly responsive. Um, and we're cutting into the backlog, but at the same time, it's still growing. People are still enrolling. There's no end of open enrollment for Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see where we are. Okay. Take, take the information, understand what we can about it, uh, and look in uh, the next year for where now, what, what is our, our next iteration? So we, we used 2014 to, um, to gather the intelligence and figure out what's needed next well, in that's 2015? Well, that, that's just sort of my exhausted yeah. bias. I've How got about you you know, a lot of friends across the street right. that are very eager and they're a co-equal branch and yeah. I'm working very closely, yeah. but I, I, I wouldn't pick anything out particularly okay, right that I'm aware of right How about right either now. of you two? Is there anything that you're looking for the legislature and the governor to do this year? that isn't already being done. Well, I think it was great that the governor acknowledged that that program is, Medicaid's gonna to continue to expand. Uh -huh. and so that I think was That's important. very important, absolutely. That which just came out in the budget last week. Last week, right? so it still going to yeah. make its way through. The $1.2 billion. Yeah, right. billion, dollars, right. Uh -huh. And so yeah. I, I think it was important to acknowledge just, you know, there are more people still wanting to get through that door yeah. and that's important to uh, do. Mitch? I would, just to say that delivery systems are very local. And you know the the challenges of delivering care in a place like Los Angeles, uh, great as they are, are, very different than the challenges in very rural areas of California delivering care, where you might have to travel 50 miles to find a specialist. Um, and that that I, I really do believe that the next set of work is all on the delivery, well, not all, but and is mostly on the delivery uh, side and at the local level. At the local level, uh, or, or yeah, so. And what about the feds? I mean, after all, this is a federal program, uh, ACA. Um, we're going to have a new secretary. Um, what, what, would you, what would you ask from the feds that we're not getting now? Or maybe it's just leave us alone. <laughs> we need a waiver, so yeah. it won't yeah, be a leave us alone. What do we alone. need from the feds to be successful? Right. We do, as Mitch says, we, um, people think of Medicaid as a national program, but it's really 50 programs yeah. plus the territories in DC. Mm -hmm. Every state has their own relationship with the federal government and it is updated periodically in what we call a waivers. They're waivers from the fundamental Medicaid law that allow you to do certain things in your state. And uh, California's current contract with the federal government expires in September of 2015. And it was that contract that provided for our low income health program mm -hmm. and the delivery system improvement program that the counties uh, have embarked on and uh, we have to renew that so we're we've begun those conversations and outlining uh, how else can the federal government partner with us in innovative ways to move to the next level uh, of health care reform um, we've had uh, 
uh, it is, there have been difficulties with, again, the enormity and the newness of this in terms mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, regulatory partnership with the federal government. And uh, we were out front doing a lot of things uh, to conform to the federal law, and then the federal government decided that it was, they, they saw it a little differently, and we've had to go back and clean some of that up. We're even doing that now with some more legislation, for example, around our open enrollment period, mm -hmm. where we adopted it, and then they changed it. So part of it is, yeah, leave us alone. Uh, let us uh, catch our breath and okay. do But they've been good partners, and mm -hmm. uh, we've worked closely with the administration. Um, but it, it, they have, um, they've had ideas about how it can work on the local level that aren't practical. So just as Mitch says, the delivery is at the local level and certainly um, Governor Brown is very committed to local autonomy wherever we can uh, uh, partner and let it happen from the ground up. Uh, our federal partners have been a little bit more assertive uh, from the top-down approach and insisting that we do things in certain ways, um, not recognizing, for example, the relationships that we have with the counties. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that now our performance will earn us some credibility that uh, we can resolve um, some so of the, one of the it would challenges also be, for, Mark, I'm sorry. I, I think yeah. it's also, I mean, I think, I mean, this is California yeah. and we've bitten off a lot of new enrollment, but I think an opportunity to go and get a waiver to include the undocumented in a state only run program is something that we really ought to talk about as a state. Uh -huh. I think it's much easier to do this if yeah. you have everybody in the boat than to have people on the outside right. and inside right. much as Mitch So started. certainly with, I was glad you mentioned that because I was going to say without federal comprehensive immigration reform, which everybody tells me now it doesn't seem like it's going to happen this year, we have a very large group of remaining uninsured and um, uh, so what 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 can we do because you know many Californians but again when we, when we do polling they their idea is that they want something that seems more like a universal health coverage that you know if some that not just certain people who are eligible but that everyone has access to some level of care when they need it Right. So, what are we going to do about the remaining uninsured for the for now? Not that immigration reform would solve all the problems. There'd still be right. other remaining uninsured, but that's a big number there. What? And, well, and clearly, Mitch, LA has thought about this issue right. a lot. Well, in right? fact, immigration reform wouldn't solve it, even if no, the. I mean, I it's a, it would be a wonderful thing, but it yeah. wouldn't solve this problem. Yes. Right. For probably ten years, because right. part of the political nexus of getting that bill past the swearing that the, the people yes. who are covered are not going to get any public benefits. So, um, you know, I, I think part of the, and I do think this is a kind of thing that could happen in California, not necessarily all over, is a recognition. The costs exist. I mean, Sandra was referring to that, right? It's people, a matter of who's going to pay right, for it. Right, it's a matter of who's going to pay for it and whether you're going to have people go to the emergency rooms at advanced stage of disease. So are you gonna take care of them in the wrong place, the most expensive place at the wrong time? Or are you gonna create a system that yeah. would enable you to take care of them in the right place in a primary care office at the right time, mm -hmm. you know, early on or by through early detection or through prevention? So, I mean, the money is spent. The money, right, the EMTALA mm -hmm. law, the federal EMTALA law requires that any person, no matter what their immigration status, can go to any hospital with an emergency room and get care. Yeah. So the dollars are being spent in the system, and the question is, is there a way to do it with organization, with, with purpose, with insight? And is there a way to um, manage the uh, issue of the remaining uninsured in California today? Well, I don't think there is a way to get federal partnership for the reasons that Mitch and Sandra okay. have described. So the question becomes, 
uh, what don't we do to spend the money that it would be that would be required to do that mm -hmm. now and that's that's a public policy choice to make um, but uh, it would be a hundred percent state financed uh, the federal government it didn't include them in the Affordable Care Act they haven't reformed uh, uh, immigration uh, and as Mitch said any reform uh, precludes them receiving mm -hmm. uh, government services so uh, it is on the long list of things that people want to do uh, in California mm -hmm. uh, to make lives better and we have gone a great distance to make a lot of lives better uh, in a relatively short amount of time yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that acknowledges that there is still very important work that is left undone. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a good place for us to yeah. now include the members of our audience because I, that's my takeaway from this conversation is we've come a long way and we started even before ACA implementation but it's taken us even further but we got a lot of things to do. Yeah, and um, partnership with the federal government, you know, um, there's some things we're going to have to figure out on our own, state-wise, and how to, how, to, uh, how to implement these things on the local level. So maybe we'll take a few questions. I'm sure you, you have questions. Somebody so. over there, Mark. Yes? Since we're taping, uh, if you can wait oh, for, for this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily Bazar with the CHCF Center for Health Reporting, and um, I have two questions. Am I allowed? One. One. Okay. You're allowed one. <laughs> Choices are hard. I know. <laughs> so I'll ask the Medi-Cal question. I'm Good. wondering if we can um, kind of tie the cost dis discussion you guys had with the Medi-Cal access discussion. Mm -hmm. And one thing, um, Secretary Dooley, when you were asked about access that you didn't mention is, um, you know, you said there's not enough cardiologists to go around, but to go around, but there are also a lot of cardiologists say they won't take Medi-Cal because they won't take the Medi-Cal at the low rates. So I don't want to, I don't want to sound too conspiracy theory-like here, um, but I'm wondering, given that a third of the population will be on Medi-Cal and you're talking about how the mm -hmm. system's going to change and cost is going to change, are you guys using the Medi-Cal system in a way to try to change the cost structure? Can you address, do you know what I'm saying? Um, by keeping those rates 47th or lower in the nation? Um. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Emily. Sure and thanks I for your good work, uh, your reporting. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Emily. Um, I think I understand that you're suggesting that it is a conscious decision to drive change by um, uh, the co keeping the costs down or the payments down. Um, the contract that we have with the federal government requires us to look at access. And in fact, in the reductions that were required to balance the budget in 11 uh, and through 12, uh, there were offsets for specialty care. I can't give you the exact numbers, but Toby Douglas can tell you how uh, there were differentials for specialty care and we've acknowledged that. Uh, under our uh, contract and the agreement that they entered into uh, with us on the, on the reductions uh, was on the basis that we would continue to monitor access and we are doing that. And so until or unless we have evidence okay, that... Okay, let me quickly follow up yeah. with that. I mean, um, you guys say it's access yet on the ground, I'm hearing... Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, I've had this conversation many times with DHCS that you guys say there's access, but if you talk to people on the ground, Mitch kind of brought this up, to people driving two hours each way to see a doctor, is that access? Well, it, it depends. It's a longer conversation, and I spent it years is, in yeah. children's health where you have limited specialists and everybody can't see them yeah. when they want to see them. There's no question that we're not going to be able to provide every level of care on a an, on an same-day visit basis. But there's something between that and where we are, and that's what we are obligated to evaluate and determine where there are adjustments that are necessary. We do that with our actuarial reviews. Uh, and there is a lot of anecdotal stories, and I think intuitively it makes sense that we can't bring this many people in and not have pressure on access. We, we believe that, but we don't have the evidence for it yet okay. to determine that we should make an adjustment to the rates. Let's take another question. Thank you. Right, over here, trying to get different parts of the room involved. There we go. Oh, geez. If we can keep the question kind of short. 
too. My name is Rose King. I'm with the, currently working for a Right to Treatment campaign. And um, there are now about 600,000 Medi-Cal enrollees who are still denied parity in mental health co uh, county plans. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered if um, the criminal justice dime um, has ever been offered to your table, which mm -hmm. I would think um, mm -hmm. someone could make a case for that, paying for parity in county mental health plans. Mitch, you want to? I, I would just say in support of your question that that there are all kinds of ways that this country spends money on incarcerating people. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the cost is over $150,000 for mm -hmm. a minimum security person who is kept in a place like the LA County Jail with a serious mental illness. And that, that this is really where, it's one place where we have an opportunity to both do better Mm -hmm. um, and at lower cost by taking people who have not committed violent crimes, who are suffering from mental illness and substance abuse, uh, and provide them treatment. And right. there's a tremendous That's room. a good question. Yeah, uh, th this is an wanna... area where I, there are some very interesting things happening in California, mm -hmm. particularly with transitional age youth and youth mm -hmm. in general where schools and juvenile <laughs> probation and mental health providers uh, really are sitting at the table and trying to figure out really how best to do this. Uh, contrast with you know the article that ran in the New York Times on Saturday about treating three-year-olds with you know stimulants. So we run a gamut of places where we have a lot of work to do. But I think one of the great opportunities we have is most people are going to have a serious persistent mental illness manifest as young adults or as late teens. And really going downstream and focusing on that where a number of places around the state are piloting and looking at this is an opportunity to look at where we improve outcomes in schools, uh, get kids before they get into juvenile hall by getting them access to the mental health services that they need and are gonna need as adults. So I think there's some promising work to be done yeah. in that age range. I think it's a good, good question and uh, brings up some points earlier, as you mentioned, you, uh, how do we integrate the mental health piece um, and, um, and your point earlier about how do we make sure that we're looking at the overall, overall wellness um, and how do we create, a, and, and Mitch, how do we create a system that's not just looking at, um, you know, providing a physician, but really at the, at the end, um, the person better, feels better off than they were when they started. Micah? I have a question for you. I just thought of a question I want to ask you all before you leave the stage. So, so we talked the about the last question. We talked about the two horses, the fee-for-service mm -hmm. horse and the sort of integrated uh, delivery system horse. I'm I'm actually worried that we're take we may be looking at taking the oats away hmm. from the integrated delivery system horse that we love talking about in California, but that has been paid for largely by employers paying more for health insurance than mm -hmm. a lot of other people, and also paid for by the Medicare Advantage program paying a lot more for that type of health care than uh, the others. So I guess my question is, if we do see, and we may see, and we already have seen, a significant exit of the folks that are providing the oats to our you know, fancy, great California delivery system that we love to talk about, what will that do and what is going to step into this breach to make sure that we have the health system that and, we want? And to, so are we really seeing evidence that employers are leaving or cutting back on, on things? I haven't uh, seen anything yet. Yeah. Well, I think it's early. Um, that's certainly a concern that's the been concern, expressed. Yeah. Um, but are we seeing that from this round of ACA implementation? Is that a 2014 I don't have any. I, I don't have any of the Mitch data in Los that Angeles, would is that support that. I have, uh, we have engaged in uh -huh. conversations with employers who recognize, particularly employers of low-wage workers, uh -huh that it is better for their workers to get the subsidy. And so they are moving into the exchange. And I, 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 ha I don't have, okay. the, that's still anecdotal right. uh, okay. information that we've so that had being, offline. That set aside, can we then go to um, Micah's question? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we need to look and see what's going to happen there. I mean, I think there's still a lot of employers that are looking at uh -huh. higher deductible plans and other uh, ways to sort of push more of this 
uh, responsibility, if you will, on the insured. Uh, and I think that should be driving what we talked about earlier, which is a lot more transparency on costs so that those uh, covered employees are making choices that are actually fully transparent to them and really thinking about where they're walking with their dollars. So I think those things are linked and there's you know, a lot of conversation about that. I think more of it is happening around the way those are being structured than completely getting out of the market. We, uh, I would offer one, one example to Michael's question, which is just again to say, well, I think it only gets so far with payment reform. So we're now doing eye exams with retinal cameras. 70% hmm. of the diabetics who get their picture taken, the retinal camera, can, the image is read by an optometrist, no ophthalmology visit necessary. Can't beat that in terms of driving down costs with payment reform. Question over here. Operational question. Uh, regarding the oh, Sacramento Bee, you referred to 900,000 people in the Medi-Cal uh, pipeline mm -hmm. that are not processed yet. Would you address what is being done specifically to address them, and how are they being harmed by this uh, delay? Hmm. Uh, we are addressing it, and uh, the, it's a rolling number. The same people aren't waiting. People are coming in at the same time we're getting people processed. Um, but with Medi-Cal, if they have a particular need, uh, they can go to a provider and that provider will expedite their uh, enrollment. And so for many of these people, they are people who haven't yet presented previously in the system. And because of the open enrollment and the publicity and their awareness, they have come to apply. And so uh, it is, uh, it, it's a big bulge that we are working through, but we're uh, revising the interface from an, I, part of it is an IT issue between the central uh, inf the technology and the county technology a uh, part of it is staffing, and we're addressing it on every level. But everyone co cooperating from the state uh, and the local counties is working to resolve this backlog as quickly as possible. So let me let me ask you the three of you this question. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, so we we started the conversation about um, you know what will change in healthcare in California. Tell me, we come back here on May 19th, uh, 2024, 10 years from now. I won't help be us here. imagine. <laughs> uh, help us imagine. Not in what, the role, but you'll be here. <laughs> help us imagine what healthcare will look like in California in 2024. Sandra? Well, you know, it's interesting uh, because of seismic reasons, you know, we're rebuilding acute care hospitals all across the state. And, uh, you know, if we get this right, um, I think that uh, the size and scope of what happens in acute care hospital will be very different than mm. it is today. And so if you just look at that one piece of the delivery system, uh, it is uh, very capital intensive, very maintenance intensive. We, uh, there's a maxim in hospitals, Mitch and I have been through this in San Francisco, that as big as you build them, you will fill them. Mm -hmm. And people really don't want to be in hospitals, and hospitals are really not safe places to be, by <laughs> and large, uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about. And so um, you could imagine a scenario where if uh, you know, uh, we get much better at genomic medicine, we use all the innovations and technologies that this state uh, has put before us, you could imagine a scenario where we're doing a lot more of this care in community-based mm. settings and outside of acute care uh, facilities, or at least significantly mm. downsized to really be ICU and very come and go for uh, highly technical uh, types of interventions. And, uh, you know, I know we have a big hospital industry and, and I, I understand its importance historically, but if you were going to take a long-term view of, of, of how we might get to the triple aim mm -hmm. uh, and where science is taking us and where technology and medicine is taking us, I think you're going to see much smaller hospitals. Very interesting and very different. Anybody want to add? Uh, I think there'll be a lot less about doctor visits hmm. along with the, you know, less hospitals that people, that people will come to understand that the basic interaction that brings health isn't necessarily a patient in a doctor's office, uh, that it will have more to do with both electronic consultations and retinal cameras and group visits mm -hmm. 
and internet discussions and that, that we will move away from the basic visit as the currency of healthcare. And Diana, you get the last word. Oh, I don't want the last word. I, I, want, the, I want the world that Sandra and uh, Mitch envision. Uh -huh. envision. Uh, I fear that um, just as uh, in Brown 1.0, we were dealing with second generation cost containment, mm -hmm. and we were only 10 years into Medicare and Medicaid, yeah. uh, and people were wringing their hands that we couldn't, it, 5% of GDP was not sustainable, and it went to 8%, and it went to 13%, and it's at 17% that uh, we'll be wringing our hands in 2024 that 25% of GDP for healthcare isn't sustainable, and we will still be sustaining mm. it. Uh, that's, that's my fear. Okay. Um, my my hope is that even if we are paying that much for the system, that we are getting the kind of care that uh, Sandra and Mitch have described, and even if we're getting it in different places, um, that it is still an economic engine that is a critical part of our economy. Because for all of the hand wringing about the cost in healthcare, uh, they are good paying jobs that support communities and um, that people um, are uh, in the healing profession. Uh, to do good work. So um, I think as my um, good friend Peter Long said along, uh, early in this uh, that the Affordable Care Act is not self-implementing and as we have seen mm -hmm. that around the country and while I'm very proud of our success I'm also glad we've been graded on the curve. We are not <laughs> absolutely good but we are relatively good and it has taken um, the cooperation and patience and partnership of really thousands and thousands of people uh, in California. And so I'm very humble to be a partner with so many people um, really changing the face of healthcare in California. Well, I just want to say that the, th the three of you have left me feeling much more optimistic about uh, where we are today, um, much, uh, much more appreciative and proud of what California has accomplished to date. And, uh, and also a much greater understanding about what, what the issues are that are remaining. And there's substantial issues uh, remaining, but um, that there's really a, a lot of hope for a better system um, uh, in, in the future. I want to thank the three of you for your extraordinary leadership at an historic time uh, of ACA implementation um, in California. And join me in thanking them for also providing a very informative uh, discussion today. I also want to thank our, our sponsors, and Phil, thank you again for, uh, for queuing this up today. I, I want to thank all of you for joining us at this lunchtime uh, and for your interest in this topic, and stay tuned for more work from PPIC on this topic. Thank you.